Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Winning Drive podcast. I'm Rita Hubbard, the NFL chick, co-host of the Glenn and Rita show on 105.7 The Fan with my guy Cordell Woodland from Shaking It Up Sports and the Ravens reporter for 105.7 The Fan. And Cordell, the Ravens are, you know, not doing anything sexy, not making any huge splashes in free agency, but are making some solid um, re-signings or solid reunion signings. So um, one of the ones was bringing back linebacker Chris Board, assuming that that's a, a special teams hire because uh, of Phillips leaving and, and they needed that guy, type of guy. But then also Arthur Millette, uh, who many, myself included, wanted to see back on the roster, signed a two-year deal with the Ravens. So wanted to get your thoughts on that. And obviously, you know, you're seeing other teams, you know, particularly let's just use Philly as an example, make all these, you know, different type of moves. And the Ravens to me are doing what they normally do in free agency. I think you're starting to see people get antsy, but also I think that these are necessary hires. Yeah. I mean, you, like you said, this is kind of what the Ravens do. And you mentioned Philly. This is also what they do. They usually are the one of the teams that are making a lot of noise this time of year. So, you know, every team has their philosophies. The Ravens have theirs, and they like to stick um, to theirs. They usually are the team that's patient, waits it out, sees, sees how the market unfolds. Usually guys fall right into, you know, their lap, and they are not ashamed to go after people's players that they cut or move on from or whatever. Um, so, I I mean, the Ravens offseason, I always joke, it usually doesn't start until after the draft because that's when they're going to start picking up some of these veterans. You get into training camp time, they'll pick up maybe an edge rusher or something like that. So, I, I in my mind, their offseason hasn't truly, truly began yet. Um, right. You, you brought up Arthur Millette coming back on a two-year deal. I think that's a good signing. Um, I thought Millette played well for the Ravens. He kind of fit with them. Um, he's kind of that hard-nosed player, plays with a lot of aggression. He's very physical. Um, and and I think he's a good dude. Talked to him quite a bit throughout the season. Um, very impactful. You know, he means what he says. He's the type of dude looking you right in the eye as he's talking to you. And um, he's got a cool backstory as well. So, yeah, I, I think it's a good sign. And um, they have question marks in their secondary, specifically at the corner spot with Ronald Darby. Uh, going elsewhere, um, Marlon Humphrey coming off of a down year. You don't know how dependable he is nowadays. Yeah. So yep. um, to get Arthur Millette, that does kind of, you know, it gives them their nickel cornerback. Um, and it pretty much kind of, solid, you know, all but solidifies that Marlon is still going to be on the outside. I don't know how people feel about that. Um, but yeah, you know, that that's something to throw out as well. So you look at this Ravens secondary and you know I, I still think that I, w- I wouldn't be shocked if they go out and get another safety maybe because we know that they like to do these three safety looks where Kyle Hamilton is able to play in the nickel um they do have our Darius Washington that they brought back but as much as they love our Darius he, he has shown that he's not very dependable he's, he's dealt with injuries pretty much yeah. every year Um, so you can't really put all your eggs into that basket. Geno Stone goes to Cincinnati. Geno allowed them to be able to move Kyle Hamilton around to be that chess piece, that ultimate chess piece that the Ravens uh, used him as. So I think that they are going to be looking for maybe another safety, probably a veteran, somebody that they can trust to put out there. Um, and we'll see what happens. But the Millette signing was, was pretty good. Um, and Chris yeah. Board, like you mentioned, you brought up him being a special teams guy. They lose Dale Sean Phillips, who was pretty much their special teams guy. Chris Board, he he just fills that role. He gives you some linebacker depth as well. He uh, he started with the Ravens, so he understands the expectations of being not only a part of the Ravens defense, but a part of this Ravens special teams. So, you know, all in all, pretty good deal. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. These were necessary signings for sure. I mean, we know that they are struggling with defensive back depth. Um, and I think that that's still something that they have to tackle, right? If you Jalen Armand Davis and Pepe Williams are also two guys that can't mm-hmm. necessarily be trusted, whether it comes to health, whether it comes to level of play. I don't know, but you're still going to have to make some decisions. And I agree with you about Adarius 
although he's shown a lot of promise, he just can't stay healthy. And Marlon, as you've already mentioned, is a guy that we're starting to see have some breakdowns now that he's getting older. So you're going to have to continue with the depth. However, I do think that this is a good signing here. They definitely needed it. Now, I, I mean, look, I would have liked to see him and Darby make their way back. Darby, unfortunately, went to Jacksonville. But I thought that these two guys played relatively well, um, you know, in their short time here. So it will be interesting to see what other moves they make. You mentioned potentially a safety move because of the Kyle Hamilton situation, allowing him to kind of have free reign. But uh, Chris Board, I mean, obviously that's a reuniting situation. He had pre previously pre uh, played for the Ravens. It allows them to have their special teams type player back. So these are solid signings. This is what the Ravens do, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I know people want um, more. There's some offensive line concerns that you got going on. There's potentially wide receiver, you know, concerns because you see Mike Williams went to the New York Jets. Um, so, you know, I've noticed, you know, people in the flock is, kind of, is starting to get a little nervous about yeah. what's going on. And I'm very confused on the nervousness because I feel like this is what the Ravens do every single year. They're not doing anything that's out of the realm for them or that is, you know, out of character. This is in character. So I guess maybe the issue is you want them to be somebody that they're not. And that's just not going to happen here with the Ravens. Yeah, I mean, you know, in one breath, people are saying we trust EDC. And then on the other side, it's like, oh, we want, why isn't he making any moves right now? I'm going to tell you, you don't want to necessarily do what the Jets are doing, right? You mm -hmm. know, nobody, I don't remember any franchise ever saying, man, I want to be more like the Jets. I don't think that's the case. Um, I wouldn't be upset with the Jets given that contract to Mike Williams. I, I Personally, I don't want anything to do with Mike Williams. Me personally, <laughs> I, I, I think that's okay. The Ravens already have enough issues with guys with injury histories and stuff like that. We've just talked about a couple of guys in the secondary alone who who you can't who you can barely trust because you don't know how long they'll be out there for you. Mike Williams is probably one of the most least dependable wide receivers in the NFL when it comes to help. So I I, I would be all right with that. Um, the Ravens just aren't a team that's just going to go out there and blow money. I mean, you mentioned the offensive line. Clearly, that that's that's a huge need for them. They've got three yeah. open spots on the offensive line right now with them trading uh, Morgan Moses. And, um, you know, they they lose Kevin Zeitler. John Simpson as well goes to the Jets with, with uh, Morgan Moses. So um, I, I get that. But there were no offensive linemen necessarily available that they probably felt like they wanted to go and get a lot of people are like, well, why didn't they bring back Zeitler? Because it seems like the contract that he got didn't necessarily break the bank. I would say that my assumption, and I'm, this is just my assumption is that they know something we don't, right? That Zeitler obviously had some injury issues this year. And I would say that they probably have a little more information on that than a lot of us are privy to. Um, so they just are taking that philosophy of we'd rather get out too early than get out too late. I'm perfectly fine with that. It seems like they want to get younger on the offensive line, moving on from Morgan Moses as well, who's a vet that is usually an Ironman type of player. He dealt with some injuries this year, had the torn pack. Um, but I, I, I think I think right now the Ravens are doing exactly what I expected them to do. I, there hasn't been a free agent offensive lineman, maybe Trent Brown or somebody like that. But even that is just like, I got to talk myself into some of those guys. It's nobody that's just like, wow, how did you let him get away? All the guys like Brandon Sheriff and all these guys that were potentially going to be free agents, their teams kept them. All the all the really quality offensive linemen that, that teams wanted, they, they kept their guys. So I think that they're content with going through the draft, seeing what, and, what Andrew Voorhees can give them next year, if anything, at one of those guard spots. Um, and, and, and rocking with there, they may snag one of these veteran guys after the draft in mini camp, you know, right before mini camp or something like that, like they usually do. But I, I really don't get the sense that they're panicking, uh, because free agency is kind of passing them by. Yeah, I agree with that. And you still got the draft. You still got June 1st cuts. So we know that some other moves will be made. Uh, in the near future with this Ravens front office. So we'll see how that moves along.
All right, so we know that the offense is changing. We just talked about the offensive line, Cordell. I mean, they have to figure out who they're going to replace the three guys that are no longer on the roster for the offensive line. We know that they've added Derrick Henry um, to the offense. Do we think that this offense is going to change much? Also, currently, um, they have a three wide receiver set with Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman, and Nelson Aguilar. So how different do you think that this offense will be with Derrick Henry than we've seen in years past, if at all? Well, it's going to look different. Um, it's definitely going to look different when you bring in a guy like Derrick Henry. It, it's, you're going to change certain things about what you do. Um, I don't think it's going to – people are trying to make it seem like the Ravens are just going to feed all the way into the Derrick Henry style, which – I think is also kind of over examined a little bit. Um, but people think that you have to go back to the stone ages of football and run power. eye, single back. Everything's going to be under the center. I don't think that's what the Ravens are going to do. Their whole point of getting Todd Munkin was to become more modern. It was to, it was to space the field. It was to lean more into Lamar Jackson streets and people are making it seem like they can't do both. Like they can't, feed into what Derrick Henry does well, and also at the same time, Lamar Jackson. Make no mistake about it, Lamar's the franchise quarterback. If there's anybody that they're going to tailor the offense to, it's going to be him first, and then everybody else. Derrick Henry coming in does not, he does not become the priority over Lamar Jackson. That's the one thing I think people are kind of misunderstanding a little bit. Um, and that's, again, not to say that we're not going to see more under center stuff. A, I think we will. B, I think we should. Um, yeah. I want more under center. I want more under center play action, more back to the defense play action. Um, and the Ravens are now with Derrick Henry, they'll be able to go into that. But people are crazy if they think that the Ravens who led the league in pistol and shotgun formations are just all of a sudden going to go away from that. That's not happening. That's not <laughs> happening. They're not going to flood the field with big bodies and take away their speed that, that that's I mean that now you're neutralizing some of the things that you do have on offense. So they're going to I, I'm trusting Todd Monk in here to kind of work his magic, figure things out to tailor this offense towards what these guys did well last year, and also what Derrick Henry brings to this team. I think just because Derrick Henry didn't live and read option and everything in Tennessee doesn't mean he can't do it. Um, I, I think that they'll he'll he's an NFL player. He'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Um, and no, it's not going to be a situation where he leads the league in carries. He's coming out of games averaging 22, 25 carries a game. I don't think that's happening. I think it'll be more realistic on average, 12 to 15 carries a game. Uh, just being realistic, maybe you'll get into the 15 to 20 range when they're winning and they're you know trying to eat clock and just continue to keep possession of the ball. Then you'll definitely see his workload increase but i i don't think that it's going to be a situation to where the ravens are wiping the slate clean going away from what they've done and now are just going to tailor their offense exclusively to derrick henry it, that that's just not realistic yeah they're not going to do it because like you said lamar is the he's the one that runs the show around here he's the you know the quarterback of the uh, the franchise quarterback of this team so he's going to be the focal point regardless okay you can plug and play whoever you want at running back. And it could have been the dudes that I would have liked over Derrick Henry, like a Josh Jacobs. Doesn't matter. Lamar Jackson is going to be the focal point of the show. I just don't know how much different, like, what is it that people are looking for? So as we know, like the Super Bowl odds for the Ravens didn't change. It stayed the same. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that, well, you already were, you know, the best running team in the National Football League. Well, how do you get better than one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because Derrick Henry got here, it doesn't change, right? There's nothing more that you have to, you know, ascend to at, after you're at one. And so I think that that's the case, right? Um, in terms of how they utilize them, I do think it will be interesting to see how that works out because you're right. I don't. It's not that I don't think that he – can't do zone reads or that they can't do RPOs, but we can't ignore the fact that in Tennessee, he didn't. 
because that's not what they asked them to do. So I'm curious to know if that's going to be something that they start implementing with this offense. I mean, listen, I think that if you incorporate a zone read, that's nasty business for a defense. Right. Right. Putting them in conflict is actually a great idea. So I would love to see more of that be a thing in this offense with Derrick Henry because – Hey, man, you know, I, I got to pick between Lamar and Henry. I mean, either one of them could potentially go off at, you know, any time. So um, th- I would like to see how that is going to work and how quickly he gets involved in those types of situations, if at all. I do agree with you. I wouldn't mind seeing them, you know, more under center. I'm curious to know if that's going to be a thing. We've also heard about. You know, um, Eric DaCosta saying he wants more, you know, uh, athletic offensive linemen. So what exactly does that mean in terms of run plays? What does that mean? You know what I'm saying? And potentially pass protection uh, situations. But I don't think that Derrick Henry changes anything philosophically. The Ravens like to run the football, mm-hmm. you know, in regular season. I want to be clear. I'm just yeah. <laughs> In regular season, what they're going to do is run the football, whether it be with the running back committee that they had, whether it be with the quarterback that they had, that's what they are going to do. And so I don't think that that changes anything. I don't think that, I mean, obviously he, because of the the type of signing that it is, it to me just says that they're going to continue the trend of running the football during the regular season. So um, I yeah, I, I, I don't know how much different this is going to work. They're still going to do that. I, I, you know, like to see a little bit more bootlegs out of this. I'd like, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Those types of situations and, you know, some more play action and all of those things. But ultimately, I, I don't think that this is going to be much different because of the philosophy of what this team likes to do than what we've seen in years past. Yeah, I mean, Tom Monken from day one emphasized forcing defenses to cover every blade of grass. Now, granted, he is also a coach that emphasized that he builds his offense tailored to the personnel that he has. So he is a guy that's going to try to do what he can to get the most out of Derrick Henry. What that looks like, we'll see. Um, But I don't think it necessarily means that the Ravens are going to start living in 22 personnel and having, you know, Patrick Ricard or whoever the fullback may be on this team and both tight ends and just having Zay Flowers as the only receiver out there. I just don't see them going back to the stone ages of football. That said, I also can see why people have their reservations about Derrick Henry in the read option. You know, I, I see both sides. I don't want to make it seem like I'm one-sided on this. This could, it could not work. It could not work. We who know, <laughs> you know, it could, anything can happen, but I, I, I can see why people may be reserved about, the read option stuff because Derrick Henry is a downhill runner. He's a powerful runner. When you're in, when you're in that read option, you can't you can't just go full speed. You kind of gotta wait around to see what happens. And once that ball, you know, once the quarterback commits to either giving you the ball at that point, then you gotta accelerate. So that's the thing. Does Derrick Henry have that type of acceleration at that point to where he doesn't need his? three to four yard head start anymore because he wouldn't be getting that. So that, yeah. that is a genuine concern. I can understand that. Uh, I, I think it's more likely to work than not. I just, like you said, you, you put in defenses in a tough predicament, they've got to pick and choose and they better be right. Whatever they yeah. pick, because uh, if you, if you decide too late that the ball is going, if you, if you look at and you think it's going to Lamar, but it actually goes to Henry, you're going to get your bell rung or you're going to open up the <laughs> hole and let this dude just go for 60 plus yards. God knows if you make the mistake and think the ball's handed to Derrick Henry and Lamar keeps it and you give up the edge, it's game over. So it, it is a tough situation that defenses are going to be in. Um, and, and the Ravens will look a little different. I, I'm curious, just like everybody else, to see just how different. I think we can all agree it'll be different, but we just don't know how much. I agree with you. So uh, it will be interesting to find out how they utilize Derrick Henry in terms of uh, whether they start uh, opting in for zone read and opting in for RPOs more so with him, even though that's not something that he's used to. So it, it will be fun to watch. And I'm sure you and I will be tracking that as the season goes on. All right. So 
we know that the Ravens are picking 30th in the NFL draft and that they're slowly in second round territory as far as I'm concerned, you know. Um, this is an interesting spot because there are guys that potentially are second round grades that find their way here at 30 um, and make their way up. Um, and you're too far along to really try to trade into a viable space where you feel like you can get greater talent um, unless you're giving up more draft picks along the line, right? Um, so there's always the possibility, because of where they are, of trading back out of the first round and creating more draft picks for, you know, collateral, maybe for years for, for not only the 2024 draft, but maybe the 2025 draft. Um, we've seen this happen before. Um, this is not out of the realm for them. But also, I think that if the Ravens have a list of guys that they believe are first rounders and they're not available, then they're potentially like we can move on to round two and then let's just grab some draft picks. By the way, I just want to acknowledge that potentially the Ravens will have 11 picks in the 2025 draft. So this is the thing because of the free agents that have left and gone to other teams. So we know that they hoard draft picks. This is what they do. They like to hoard draft picks. They like to accumulate them. Um, would you be surprised if they don't? trade back Cordell. I think that the possibility of them trading back is, uh, you know, obviously very real, but would it yeah. be more surprising to you if they don't do that? Uh, it wouldn't be surprising, you know, you're in the first round, especially depending, it all depends on the board. Obviously when you're, when you have the 30th pick, you know, it, it you kind of got to let the board dictate what happens. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they said, especially if their guy is there, they want to take sure, you know, they, that could definitely be the case. I think it's more likely that they keep the pick than not to be honest with you. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely believe it's a possibility that these guys could trade back. And I know, you know, uh, people aren't too fond of that team on the other side of the beltway, but this could be one of them times where both sides help each other out where I look at a team like the commanders who have two second round picks. They got three third round picks now with that trade to, uh, to move Sam Howe to uh, Seattle, their second round pick. They have the 36th pick in the draft. That second round pick is as good as a late first rounder. And that's a team you, when you start talking about trading back, you're looking at teams that a have the draft capital to be able to move back into that part of the first round, but also a team that, has a lot of needs and the commanders, they fit both of those boxes. So I would not be surprised if a team like the commanders who have multiple second round picks end up trading one of those, maybe a third as well to move up and get and move into the 30th pick in the first round. If you're the Ravens, you're not losing much. You're only sliding back. What about five picks four, four or five picks at that point? You, your guy may still be there. Right. And you pick up extra picks, uh, you know, an extra third rounder as well, assuming that that's the, the offer that's put out there. But, yeah, I think that's a team that has the trade assets that also has the team needs to be able to make it happen. And we assume that they're going to go quarterback in the first round. Who knows? This is also a team that needs offensive line. Maybe they go in uh, one of these tackles that maybe the Ravens don't love but right. the commanders do love, you know, yeah. and they, and they want to slide in. So I just use them as an example because they seem to be a team that are picking high enough in the second round to where it's not a huge drop off, right? The second pick in the second round from the 30th pick in the first round, that, that that's, that's not going very far. If you're the Ravens, you may still be able to get your guy and pick up an extra pick. Cordell is always going to look out for his commanders, no matter what. So <laughs> shout out to hey. you for trying to find a way. <laughs> Nobody's to got to. <laughs> but to get them uh, moved back into the first round for some uh, deeper and, collateral, and, and, and they and they are just one of the options. You know, there there are other teams, like you said, the Ravens have eleven picks. The Ram, the, they 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 were just a team that has 
the you know the second round capital because that's what you're looking for when you're moving out of the back of the first round you're going to want something good in that second round uh so it doesn't get much better than the second pick in the, in the second round that that's just more they they kind of conveniently fit the mold of what it would take to to move on from that pick yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, I, I, it's 50 50 for me. I think that, you know, if the talent that they believe that they graded as a, a level one or round one talent is gone, then they're going to trade back. And they're going, like you said, it's going to have to be with a team that is trying to get back into the first round, but also has good second round coverage that they don't feel like that they're losing. They're not too far out in terms of, you know, the next round to get whatever talent that they felt like was more of a grade around two level. So, um, you know, I can make a case for both. I can make a case for saying that there's a tackle that's there or a guard that's there, and they feel like that they were like a high second, but they're going to go ahead and just take him in the first because they think he's not going to be there maybe by the start of the second, then they make the move. If they feel like that there's a guy that there's um, a deal that they can make with a team that will put them in better position from a draft picking perspective in terms of, you know, accumulating extra picks, then they're going to, you know, do that as opposed to take what's left for the first round. So uh, it, you, you, it's a good problem to have, I guess, but it, it would have been a better problem if you were 30 seconds. So then it wouldn't feel so right. bad about right. how this is going. Right. Uh, you know, it's a, obviously, you know, you can find some talent late, you know, because, you know, Hey, they, they got Todd heap. Uh, at, at one point late, uh, I think he was the 31st or 32nd overall pick one year. It happens. You can find good talent late mm-hmm. in, the, in, in those in the first round. But um, ultimately, Lamar Jackson, that was a trade. I mean, and they traded up for Lamar, right? right? I mean, right. Lamar was literally potentially going out of the first round had they not traded up for Lamar. And so you're right. You know what I'm saying? I guess I think I was thinking more like organically, but right, I, think right. I got you. Point. It's still a great point because Lamar, that, that was, he was the 32nd pick. So, I mean, he literally was about to go to the second round anyway. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And it was it, smart on their behalf because getting someone in the first round, another thing, this is what you, you got to think about too, is like, do you like this talent enough to, you want to be able to abode the fifth year option right. on that right. player? You know what I'm saying? So there's that part of it too. But again, picking at 30, it, it ain't but so many guys left that you feel like are grade one or or, or round one talent. So you have to kind of figure out, is it more profitable for my franchise to pick up drafts? Because we keep hearing about how deep this uh, offensive line draft is, right? And how, you know, it, it's able to find, are you able to get the guy or someone that's on your board in the second round if you trade down? Or do you feel like I have to get this guy at 30? No, I'm not willing to do that. So it, it really depends on how the board moves, I think, and, and where the Ravens go with that. That's not a decision that they're probably going to make until later and, right. and watch when they watch the flow of, you know, how the draft moves. But I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah, I mean, you look at the you look at the last two drafts, they've been they've had the benefit of having their guys fall yeah. into their laps. I mean, yep. Kyle Hamilton fell to them at 14. You had Tyler Lindebaum, and they were able to get Lindebaum later on in the first round as well. Um, and then last year, they were able to get Zay um, late in the first round also. So, I mean, look, picking 30th, it's kind of tough to kind of hope that your guy falls all the way to 30 for you. But the crazier things have happened. We we, yes. we see it all the time. Puka Nakua goes in the fifth round this past year. There's no don't That's understand. Well, you know what? I do understand it to a little bit of the point was like, you know, BYU is not a team that I think a lot of people were necessarily watching mm-hmm. post Zach Wilson. And so he kind of slipped through the cracks, but I still don't understand how a guy mm-hmm. like Puka goes into the fifth and, round. And, you know, where you're drafted and the coaching that you get plays a huge part in yes. into everything. You know, who's to say Puka is this guy if he's, you know, in, in in New York with the Jets or with the Giants or, or anywhere, you know, it, it, situations matter, you know, with a lot of these rookies. That's what I think a lot of people don't realize that everybody's quick to call guys a, a bust or whatever, or even some of these guys that end up working out. But it's a lot of the surrounding factors that go, all these dudes can play. Let's be clear. All, all these dudes can play. Um, I think it's just a matter of what happens once they're drafted that determines how good they're going to be. And, 
you know, for the Ravens, they've been able to get something out of their first round guys these last couple of years. Um, so you'd imagine that if they do stay at 30, whoever they get, first of all, they've got nine picks that with this is not, I think nine picks in the draft right now. Um, and they, they need a, quite a few of those picks to hit because they have some starting spots to fill right now. So they need guys that have not, that if at worst, if they can't start, they're ready to at least contribute uh, to the team this year. So I, I do think Eric DeCosta is going to do his homework. And if he does end up trading, it'll be something that he feels like, you know, is worth his while. He's not afraid to trade. He talks right. about it a lot, you know, especially if it, can result in him getting an extra pick. You Absolutely. know, I, I think I think that's something he'll definitely entertain. I'm definitely, you know, confident that he it, look if he feels like he needs to pull the trigger, that's what he's going to do. No questions asked, as long as it's um, compensated fairly, and, and as long as he feels like he's getting the right value for it, I can absolutely see that happening. So we want to thank you all for listening. I mean, obviously, we're still getting close. Not no cigar, but we're close. Mm -hmm. about, about five weeks out from the NFL draft, uh, you know, and so uh, it's something to look forward to draft boards and project projections and, you know, all of these things and trying to figure out where guys are going to go and who the Ravens will be picking. So I'm sure we'll have multiple conversations about that moving forward. So we want to thank you all for listening from Cordell to me. This is winning drive. <laughs>